Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm chairing this session together with Jörn and Sandip, as you said. And, and I haven't prepared uh, any presentation now uh, on slides, but we do have five current and former PhD students to, to present today to kind of represent the, the breadth of research we are working on and say a bit about their experiences doing research within HISP and centered on DHIS2. Uh, so we have, um, we have Wilfred, Seferino, Olav, Bjornar and, and Pamud. And Bjornar from Norway and Pamud from Sri Lanka are in the middle of their PhDs, uh, early to middle, and can say a bit about, about that. Uh, Olav, also from Norway, has just finished. And we have some old timers, uh, Seferino from Mozambique, and Eden from Togo, and, and all over West Africa. You can say something about how they now engage in, in the research. I think the main message of today is that, you know, we, we hope that, that uh, the research we do and, and us as researchers can contribute to the continued strengthening of DHS2 and implementations. But we also think that implementations and those who are involved in that and in development of DHS2 should be invited more to uh, participate also in research. I mean, this, this is, is the, the core of the action research uh, foundation of, of HISP is that there should be, you know, close knit um, relationship between development, implementation, and, and research. And, and for some of us, that, uh, those activities, uh, you know, the, the distinction is quite blurred, but that's not natural if, if you work a lot with implementation uh, necessarily. So I think we, we can also then after the presentations discuss, you know, as a community around DHS2, the HISP community, that includes everyone, um, on here today and, and everyone joining the, the conference, how can we together um, do good research, action research, implementation research? So I think we'll have a, a good presentation, uh, set of presentations first, and, and hopefully we can revisit this theme of, you know, how to, to, to strengthen this, this uh, collaboration and reduce the gap that may have emerged between implementation and research. So, so before um, giving the word to the, to the current and, and former PhDs, maybe Jörn or Sandeep would like to add something. No, you have uh, formulated everything very well, uh, Johan. What we want to uh, achieve uh, is to engage those who are involved in implementation around in the different uh, countries engage more in research and how to actually do that that is something we can we can uh, continue working on which is starting now another thing that we want to achieve is to ensure that those who have been part of the research like the phd students etc like seferino and Edem are examples of how they can continue to be part of the research so so is it two two twofold ambition there? Okay, thank you. So let's go on to the to the presentations. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, if you have thought of uh, an order of things. I have thought of, about it, but have forgotten to inform <laughs> those. <laughs> but why don't we start? Uh, with the with, with, with the youngest in terms of the PhD, San Bjornar and, and Pamud. And then continue with Olav and, and uh, Sifrion and, and Eda, for example. Yeah, so maybe just uh, I'll give the word to the first one on my list of, of those you mentioned. And so Bjornar, do you mind going first? Sure. I suppose you hear me and not, please, uh, Johan. Yes, we can hear you. Let me see. And there is hopefully my screen as well. Uh, so hello, I'm Bjornar and uh, I'm a PhD research fellow at the Department of Informatics at the University of Oslo. 
So I've been given the honor of uh, stealing seven minutes of your lives today to talk a bit about the HCIS2 research. And the subheading I was generously awarded by Professor Jörn is how to do and the importance of PhD DHIS2 research. But since I am just in the first year of my PhD journey, I have wondered a bit, um, who am I to explain how to do PhD research? So therefore I will focus mostly on uh, the first phase of uh, the PhD journey, which is where a PhD Ricky like me acquires the fundamental knowledge and the building blocks needed for further research. So my take on the how to do research part will be more like a how to kickstart a researcher career. So I started my PhD journey in August last year in the middle of a worldwide uh, pandemic. The world is locked down, the travels are no-go and uh, even university aulas uh, are empty. Uh, but to look at the bright side, uh, I haven't experienced anything else during my PG journey. So for me, this has just been the normality, empty hours and all that. So I mean, uh, when you enter a reality without previous knowledge of, uh, of it, how do you know what you're missing out of? Like the author Hunter Thompson said, you can't miss what you never had. Uh, but that was a sidetrack. And my intention is not to paint a glossy picture of the pandemic. Uh, so let's move on. You've all seen this uh, famous map, the global impact of DHS2. Uh, there is no doubt there is, that there is happening quite a lot of exciting stuff in, uh, with DHS now. The HISP network is rapidly uh, expanding, conquering new geographical areas such as Latin America, as well as charting new domains. And one of these new domains is uh, education. And that is the domain where I'm going to do my research. Uh, with more than 100 countries using the IGS2, there is obviously quite a bit that we can learn from each other. And one of the great things with these the DHS2 academies and annual conferences is to hear about experiences from other implementations. Another way to build and share uh, knowledge on DHS2 implementations and usage and data use and effects and the results and all that is through research. As a DHS2 researcher, as a researcher, you could uh, contribute to increased knowledge on uh, this uh, fascinating computer system, which in turn has the potential to benefit more than 2 billion people. That's a lot of people. Uh, so as you might guess, this is not a small research field. Uh, did a Google Scholar search and uh, it reveals that to date that the, there are more than 3000 publications on DHS2. So with only nine years to go to fulfill the 2030 sustainable development goals, there is really no time to lose. So why can you not join this awesome worldwide research community? I think you should. To do a PhD is not, it's not that hard. I mean, it's a little bit of work, but um, uh, so there's obviously some things that need to be in place, but uh, everybody could do that. Uh, I've always, always thought that it sounded cool to be a researcher. You know, the ones you hear about in the news. The researchers have now discovered this awesome new discovery and so on. So when I got the chance to become one of those researchers, how could I say no? However, uh, I soon realized that I couldn't just wander out into the world, ask some questions and submit, submit these answers to a journal. Uh, so as a PhD research fellow, we are, if you like it or not, we are theorists, academics. And that's why there is a requirement to spend half a year or something like that on courses during your PhD, uh, so that we can acquire some very useful knowledge we can use for our research. You can, of course, choose from several courses at the university, but the ones I found most interesting uh, for my DHS2 for education research is the information systems theories course, ICT for development, action research. And in addition to this, you also have to do a ethics course. I was not sure how it would be to go back to the school again after 10 years of absence. Uh, but the truth is that I've learned so much from these courses. All the courses contribute a really good introduction to the relevant literature in the field. And they kind of forces us to reflect on the lots of interesting stuff going on such as uh, ethical considerations. And the theory courses also help us understand how different theories can be relevant for our research settings. 
And the assignments and the exams in the courses, they're also good starting points. Uh, and for me, they served as the building blocks for my very first article. So in other words, these courses, they do give a really awesome kickstart for the PhD journey. Uh, as for the lockdown situation, uh, the professor solved it brilliantly uh, this year, last year, by using digital tools such as Zoom, which we all know by now. So in the image here, you can see uh, the professor uh, Sandip Sahai in a pre-recorded lecture. Uh, so it was very good to see the videos. Uh, kudos for finding good teaching solutions. This was a little bit of what I do know from what I've been through so far. Uh, so if you're looking a bit forward, I said initially, who am I to talk about research? And I would like to restate that as I'm looking into the future. Born and raised in Norway, who am I to write research articles on findings from Africa and all, of, all over the world? So the harsh th truth is that I'm nobody. I cannot do research on my own. Uh, none of the re his researchers can do research on their own. And that's why action research is so important. I mentioned action research as one of the courses on the previous slide. And briefly put, action research is a kind of research which uh, lets researchers take an active part in the research setting, contributing to changes and by that generating knowledge. Uh, so the researchers, we the researchers, we rely on you guys. Uh, we need you and your input to do good research. So that's why during the next 12 to 18 months, I will reach out to some of you to gather information for my research. And hopefully if the pandemic ceases to be a pandemic, I will also physically visit some of you guys to better understand how you deal with PHS2 and how you do use this in your awesome work. Uh, and the results from these visits, observations and conversations will then be analyzed before they're published in scientific articles as revolutionary new knowledge. And when my three years are coming to an end, all the experiences and learnings are wrapped up in the PhD thesis, and I will hopefully be awarded one of those uh, hats you can see there. Uh, yeah, and this picture is uh, from my last field trip 10 years ago. I'm really not that young anymore. So as you have might, might have realized by now, uh, this kind of research is really interesting, and most of all, it's meaningful being part of a community that every day works for the greater good of this planet, making the world a better place for all. It's a really great inspiration. So kudos to you guys for the amazing work you're doing. And I hope to meet you physically, physically someday in the future. And if you have some questions about the exciting PhD journey, do send me an email, please. And thank you for your seven minutes and over and out. Thank you, Bjornar. I think we'll go, go straight to the next presenter, Pamod. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Come on, let me share my presentation. Yeah, hope you can see my screen. Right. So now that Bjorna has uh, kind of highlighted uh, so much about what happens in the PhD, I will try to uh, brief uh, in this seven minutes uh, what really inspired uh, me who's coming from implementation background to do the PhD and what is the benefit for the HISP community and for uh, people who are implementing information systems uh, by doing a PhD. So a little bit of background about what we actually do when we are implementing. So uh, I have been implementing information systems uh, during the last one decade or so. So uh, uh, it, my entire team in Sri Lanka have been implementing different types of DHS2 systems, like it could be aggregate, tracker, Android, and recently some advanced integrations, uh, integrations as well as uh, developing web applications. So we do a lot of stuff. But now, when we are actually implementing, uh, even though we don't realize, we do all these things. We talk to people, we observe, we study information flows, we design and we customize the DHIS2, we train people, uh, we prepare documents and SOPs, and we write reports to uh, uh, the donors, development entities, and the ministries. So we do a lot of these things. And finally, we might get successful implementations as well as failures. Now, one issue that I was really curious about was like, what really happens? Uh, say for example, like if there is a failure, uh, I mean, what, uh, how, how does it matter? 
So the thing is like, we can learn from the failures. If uh, we encounter similar issue again, we can apply that knowledge. But then again, if someone else who actually tries to explore this scenario first time, how is that person going to get to know? So one thing is like, uh, uh, usually people write what really happens. So in reports uh, or internal training programs, they mention this happened. So please don't do this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, don't, don't take this approach next time. So this, these kind of uh, things happen. Or else maybe you have a community of practice. But uh, a deficit I have seen is like, we don't really explore why or how it happened. So that like, if, if we can really understand why it happened, we can prevent it and the knowledge can be shared. So let me explain uh, my approach and uh, uh, so what I've been doing in this first year of my PhD uh, in the last couple of months. So this, uh, is, what you're seeing here is, uh, is from our COVID-19 surveillance system in Sri Lanka. So what, what is fascinating about this system is like we have been able to design an entire surveillance system for COVID-19 with all these modules, which is inside that system within a, a matter of like four to, uh, four to five months. So the thing is, like uh, most of us who are from implementation, they might know, right? It's very difficult to get so many people engaged and to design a system like this in such a short, a short span of time. So the question I had is like, I mean, how is that possible? So how are we able to produce this kind of ecosystem um, where like you have so many components, so many other stakeholders coming in, integrations are there, and also to deploy it rapidly. So the thing is, uh, the questions I had was like, I mean, how, how is it organized? What really made it possible? Um, I mean, like uh, why something else did not happen? Like usually we try to get stakeholders on board into, uh, into our, our, our discussions, but people like, I mean, they, they just reject, they, they don't come on board. And what are the challenges? What is the approach? Why we selected an approach like this? Has similar thing happened in the past? And can it be different next time? Or else, uh, whatever happened in Sri Lanka, is it generalized so that I can share it with others so others can learn and do it again? Like, I mean, in, in case they are going to do the same, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So this is when, uh, I mean, kind of coincidentally, this is the exact time I joined my PhD program. And in the PhD, uh, as uh, Biona just highlighted in his previous presentation, we do a lot of things. We learn, like we learn how to do the literature. Uh, what are the theoretical aspects uh, around whatever we are seeing and how to do a uh, kind of action research. So all these things we learn in the PhD and also we learn to uh, perform action research. So we are doing implementations and uh, whatever we learn, the theoretical aspect and all this uh, searching literature and all, while we are doing the, uh, doing the implementation, we can apply that knowledge into our implementation and analyze it carefully. So let's see uh, the approach that we took. So, so far what uh, we have done uh, in Sri Lanka is like we identified few data sources on um, how to gather this information about uh, around various questions I had. So this is kind of like the different data sources. And then uh, once you do uh, identify these data sources, you can do some analysis and then you can find some uh, thematic area concepts kind of like broadly highlighting um, uh, like um, I mean, what really caused uh, all the, I mean, this entire scenario. And once you identify these thematic areas and concepts, you try to uh, uh, formulate something broader, right? Uh, this may be a kind of an abstract thing. I mean, this is now uh, like, so what really happens is physically, uh, I mean, in a practical scenario, this uh, collecting data and kind of analyzing, I found it a bit uh, comfortable. But like when you go deeper, like uh, come into inferences. So this is some area that we usually struggle because uh, especially we are coming from implementation background and we are not familiar too much about uh, this uh, theoretical aspect of it. But and this is where uh, the supervisors really play a major role uh, trying to say, okay, now you are coming from a, a, a kind of empirical background, you are implementing, but look at this in a different way and you can identify some theoretical aspect and try to apply it. And this is when you can produce a, a masterpiece, which of course can be shared with others. So once you are done with this final uh, entire big thing, next important thing is uh, you need to share. So this is what uh, I have been trying to do. Like uh, I have applied, uh, I mean, submitted uh, what, we, what I have done so far into one or two journals. And also there are so many conferences. So in conferences, what we usually do from his space, uh, we try to uh, highlight our implementation and basically, uh, 
try to showcase the challenges and the solutions. So that's that's where we usually stop. But here, of course, what I have tried to do in the last couple of months is not just to highlight uh, challenges and solutions, try to apply a bit of theory and try to make it a bit more concrete so that uh, any country, like, I mean, irrespective of where it is, uh, anybody else who's going through the work that we have done uh, are able to apply it. And uh, so this is the most important thing, the sharing the knowledge. So this is what has happened so far in my couple of months of uh, PhD journey. What I wanted to highlight mainly was that, uh, I mean, even though we are coming from implementation background, we, we don't realize until we really start doing research what a lot we can contribute. So I will just stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pamod. And I'll give the word to Olav. Yes, thank you. I just had to scare off a few kids to try to get in the room. And I'll share my presentation. Um, so uh, what I was uh, thinking I could do um, was to essentially share, share an example of a DHIS2 based PhD, uh, which is uh, Hopefully soon over, I've submitted my PhD. I haven't yet uh, defended it. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do was to essentially share uh, the journey I've been through so far uh, over this last, uh, what is it now, eight years. Um, so I came from uh, doing a master thesis on DHIS2. So I was sort of already a bit brainwashed. Uh, uh, when I started uh, and I applied to my PhD uh, with an idea of studying how uh, mobile technology could be used as a sort of an extension of DHIS2 to um, reach the facility community level. Uh, but in practice, that never really, I never really started on that path uh, because uh, at the time, um, Senegal requested uh, support from the university on uh, starting their implementation of DHIS2. Uh, and because I spoke a bit of French, I was a good candidate to go there and do that as um, part of my fieldwork. Um, and I also got involved in other projects in the West African region. So with the West African Health Organization, who was uh, working to establish a regional data warehouse. Um, and also in other countries like Gambia and Liberia. Uh, and so that was sort of the starting point and working in this uh, sort of the day-to-day -day work there on DHIS2, supporting the implementation, uh, setting up DHIS2, uh, supporting training of users and also the core team there. Um, sort of some research topic emerged uh, more or less from that work. Um, so I started to look at how uh, cloud computing uh, both had potential to uh, uh, support these kind of uh, implementations, but also had certain challenges. Um, I also uh, became interested in this whole idea of uh, information system architectures based on uh, experience working with DHIS2 in different countries and uh, looking at how all kinds of different factors influenced how their uh, overall health information architecture actually um, uh, came to be. So that's uh, that was sort of the first phase of my PhD. Um, then a couple of years into uh, my PhD, I was asked whether I would be interested in taking a leave from my PhD to uh, go on a secondment to WHO um, initially for a year, but I ended up staying there for two and a half years. Uh, so this wasn't strictly part of my PhD per se, but uh, while in WHO, I um, started working on these metadata packages, which you've uh, probably heard of a few times so far this week. Um, so uh, I started working on those while in WHO, and as I came back 
uh, from my secondment and continued with my PhD work. Uh, that sort of uh, naturally emerged as a new focus for my uh, both practical uh, work, uh, sort of empirical research, and also um, a lot of my writing. So based on this, my research focus uh, changed towards uh, standardization and looking at how digital platforms such as DHIS2 can support standardization, uh, which is part of the whole uh, metadata package uh, initiative. Uh, and I, at this point, I, like I said, I've now uh, submitted. I'm uh, hopefully soon uh, within the category of Edem and Seferina who has finished. Um, and I think just to final comment that I've found during this work, uh, and as is probably obvious, uh, at least for me, uh, there hasn't been a clear plan uh, from the beginning of what I was going to focus on, what the empirical work should be. And I think part of the challenge is that there are so many opportunities within the DHIS his world, so many cases, so many topics. Um, that are of great interest uh, and just not enough time to delve into all of them. So thank you. That was what I wanted to share. Thank you, Ola. Then I think uh, we have um... Maybe three that have uh, finished: Wilfred, Seferino, and uh, Edem. Will Will you start, uh, Edem? Do we have Edem here. Yes, we need to make Edem also the co-host. Seferino is already co-host, so if you're ready, please, uh, Seferino. I don't know them now. Okay, thank you, Max. I mean, uh, I can start. <coughs> I was not able to unmute myself. Okay, yes, uh, please. go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, and uh, thanks to the <clears throat> to the team for giving me the opportunity to share uh, my experience on uh, uh, doing a PhD within the HS2 uh, community. So let me try to share my screen. One minute. Screen. Yes. Oops. Mm. Yep. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good. So, uh, uh, prior to my uh, uh, enrollment into PhD uh, program at the University of Oslo. Uh, I can say I was uh, working on uh, an IT for a development firm in Mali, where I was working on uh, applying IT in various domains such as health, agriculture, uh, education, and so forth. I've been doing some exciting works. And uh, uh, at that time, personally, I was. Uh, an open source and IT activist, with action oriented. And of course, as a medical doctor, I was seriously brainwashed into positivism. But uh, uh, at the same time, I was also aware that my perspective on IT was not uh, very wide. And uh, I also knew that I wasn't uh, skilled enough to reflect on uh, all the exciting works that I have been doing. And I was also dreaming of uh, doing uh, a PhD in order to, to give back 
to a younger generation because I was also aware that we we didn't have at that time enough uh, qualified uh, people to lecture on various IT domains in our uh, universities. So uh, in twenty uh, in two thousand eight uh, came the opportunity to to enroll into the PhD uh, research at the University of Oslo. And uh, one of the key interesting things for, for me in uh, this program is uh, the flexibility, because uh, I had the opportunity to combine uh, my work with my research, which is, that was very important for me because I wasn't going to lose ground on uh, uh, what I was already doing. And uh, being part of this uh, uh, research community, focusing on action uh, research means for me, uh, having the opportunity to do uh, a lot of uh, field work. And uh, still in terms of uh, flexibility, uh, I had, and that's the case for me, uh, enrolling into this uh, PhD program is that you have the, poss the possibility to, to avoid the, the thrilling Norwegian winter if you want. Otherwise, you can also be there and uh, experience all the winter exciting activities, such as uh, living in uh, this kind of uh, beautiful cabin during the winter or doing ski and so forth. And uh, it was also great for me to be part of a very cool international environment at. Uh, uh, the Department of uh, Informatics there. But um, one of the challenge for me was that as uh, a Francophone, uh, having to work in, uh, in English in a country where the language is Nor Norway was uh, a bit uh, worrying. But uh, rapidly, uh, I realized that this was, I mean, uh, it was a very international environment. Everybody was speaking English. English is the working language, and even in the country town, everybody is speaking English. So it was, it was not difficult for me. But the most difficulty was for me uh, coming from a francophone country to be able to to write uh, academic papers in English in academic English. That was a, a very key challenge for me. And uh, obviously. Uh, as of uh, all PhD uh, research, at the beginning, you are very excited of being a researcher. But uh, at the later stage, you ask yourself if it was a good decision to actually enroll in this PhD uh, research because it's uh, very demanding. Uh, you have to be focused, you have to, to, uh, to focus on your research write academic papers, and then at the end, work on your on your kappa. But the good thing is that there are always uh, people and mechanisms in place to support and uh, to motivate you, even if uh, you are close to abandoning your research, you will have people to motivate you to get you back on track. So uh, in my case, uh, I was doing uh, an action research uh, project. But uh, of course, as you can see from the title, uh, I was doing uh, more action because as I said, I'm a very action or oriented uh, guy. Uh, <clears throat> and at the time when I started, there was less implementers in early days of uh, DHS2. So uh, there was a lot of uh, rewarding actions to take. Uh, opportunities are overwhelming, as uh, Olaf said, so it's easily to, to get carried away. I was involved in action in many countries, Sierra Leone, Gambia, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Malawi, Benin, Ghana, and so forth. And obviously, if you are involved in uh, more action, it means you will do less uh, research. But the good point is uh, sooner or later, uh, the research component will claim its share on you. And uh, you have at the end of the day, 
you have to uh, work on your papers, you have to, you have to write your kappa and uh, you have to defend your thesis. So uh, in my case, uh, as, as I said, I started in uh, 2008. It was a lot of action. Uh, I had to take uh, some time off for personal reasons and I came back to continue the, the work. And uh, I was able to defend my thesis finally in uh, 2016. So uh, what are the benefits uh, for me? Uh, I think academically, it was very enlightening and uh, it broadened my perspective on, uh, on IS. I was not just an IT passionate, but uh, now I can see that uh, the, the reality about uh, IS is uh, multiple. Uh, professionally, uh, this PhD research uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, still be grounded in uh, my professional life through the, the field work I've been doing. Uh, I was also able to build a stronger uh, network uh, through the various uh, opportunity I have to meet with uh, many great people uh, at the University of Oslo, but also outside the university in countries where I've been working. And in terms of uh, prospects, uh, doing a PhD research in a DHS2 uh, community uh, give you the possibility to continue as an academic or also uh, as a practitioner or both, which for me is something uh, very, uh, that should be appealing for many people. Uh, culturally, it was uh, life enriching for me because uh, I have to, I came across uh, many cultures, uh, many people from uh, a different culture. I learned a lot and uh, I can say that after uh, completing my PhD, I became a different person. So personally, yes, it was a pride to have uh, uh, a PhD. And uh, is having a PhD is not necessarily, I mean, it doesn't make you necessarily uh, smarter but for sure uh, you will be less stupid. Uh, morally, it was also rewarding uh, because uh, it gives you the opportunity to, to make change in people's life through the actions uh, you are doing in countries, helping people to solve problems is very rewarding. Uh, generating and pass on knowledge uh, to other people is uh, also very interesting for me. And uh, uh, through the, this PhD, I also had the opportunity uh, to create uh, opportunity for others. And uh, I've been also uh, able to inspire others. And today, I can say that uh, I mean, many people uh, have the opportunity to work in DHS2 uh, community uh, through what uh, I and uh, other people in the community we, we have done. And that is very important. And of course, uh, uh, DHS2, the DHS2 community or family, I would say, is always there, uh, even after the, the PhD. So uh, uh, to, to finish my, my talk, uh, what is life after the PhD in a DHS2 community? I can say that I'm still in this uh, community. I feel I'm uh, a living member of uh, this community. I have, the, I have the opportunity to lead uh, the East West and Central African group. And uh, we are contributing to uh, various uh, his uh, research projects. We are still part of uh, the longitudinal uh, his uh, research. And uh, we are also uh, supporting DHS2 project globally and also in, uh, in countries. So thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Eden. So maybe then we move on to Wilfred. Okay, thank you. Let me try to share my screen.
you can stop sharing your screen, Adam. Oops, sorry. Yep. Hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, we see it. Okay. Uh, okay, so hi everyone, um, wherever you are around the globe. My name is uh, Dr. Wilfred Signoni, here to present um, a little bit of how uh, DHS2 research and how we, how I have uh, approached the DHS2 um, or at least the PhD journey uh, throughout my uh, my career. So um, first of all, um, I completed my PhD in January 2021, so I'm a little bit fresh. <laughs> um, I started my PhD in January 2016, so it took me around five years to complete this uh, PhD journey. Um, yeah, it was uh, up and down um journey but uh, it was also fun engaging and enlightening i think um, the past five years i've i've, uh, I've explored uh, and i've also journeyed through different paths different countries with this particular opportunity and it also kind of enlightened me in different ways um yeah so basically this PhD was uh, under the Department of Informatics, uh, University of Oslo. Uh, and my title was uh, Institutional Work in Strengthening Health Information Systems in Fragmenting Settings, an Action Research Study of Information Dashboards in East Africa Community and Indonesia. Now I get a lot of questions, what happened between East Africa Community and Indonesia? What was the link? So I thought of, you know, and tried to kind of um, uh, start a little bit of giving you a, a, a context of the research, how it started. So before I, I, I joined my PhD, uh, I've been a um, you know, information system implementer, DHS2 implementer for a number of years, and I've been working with the University of Oslo um, in, in implementing different kinds of uh, projects. Now, one of the projects which we were implementing was an East Africa community building a regional system and you know, through that particular project, it motivated me to um, engage, you know, dive in a little bit more on research, uh, conduct the research on that, you know, seeing how how this particular regional system can be adopted. Um, what are the challenges in adopting the regional system in terms of, you know, um, uh, implementing standards across different countries, which you know they have different standards. They have different implementation approaches and etc. So it was quite a, a quite an interesting uh, a, a project which we started in 2013. Um, and during that implementation, it got me interested in doing research, um, specifically PhD. And then in 2016, I enrolled in the uh, University of Oslo to start my research. And this was. Uh, East Africa community become my first use case in terms of, you know, uh, understanding uh, the, the, the standardization problem which are there and how do you mitigate this kind of uh, uh, standardization or kind of uh, implementing standards. So East Africa community is composed with a couple of countries, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania in the beginning, uh, and later on South Sudan also joined and there are a lot of work which we did for uh, uh, East Africa community. Now, as one of my colleague, uh, some of my colleagues also said, uh, doing research in um, University of Oslo, at least in DHS2 space, uh, provides or gives you a number of opportunities. And through my PhD also, I was faced with a number of opportunities. Um, for example, I was exposed in, you know, doing similar work in Somalia, where the Somalia country um, had three states. And in each state, they have different standards. So it was also how do you accommodate, um, you know, implementing a national information system in that particular setting where you have different kind of uh, standards between different states and, and, and other opportunities. 
Um, however, the, there is a one opportunity which came out, uh, which got me interested uh, enough to actually include it also in my, my research. And this was uh, uh, the Indonesia uh, use case where we were tasked to you know, build a district dashboard in a country where there is a lot of uh, proliferation of um, you know, fragmented information systems. Um, it was a project which talks about you know, building a district dashboard and something which I was very kind of uh, interested to, to work with dashboard. And one, as I said, my title, one of my key uh, object was you know, to look about how dashboard can promote such kind of a standardization. So uh, through that, you know, um, this is more or less the structure which we saw in Indonesia. It was part of fragmented, you know, in terms of you know programs reporting directly to uh, to the higher level within, without uh, you know talking to each other. And the idea was, you know, to come up with this particular district dashboard to kind of integrate. So um, through that, I was exposed or I gained access to Indonesia country, worked there for quite a long time with the Ministry of Healthcare, a lot of people are in Indonesia and it exposes me to a lot of kind of uh, um, uh, uh, experiences. Some of the work which we did, you know, was, you know, for example, going to the field, to the health facility, uh, to the community, talking to people, even though there were different languages, barriers, but. You know, it was quite interesting to do research in that particular context, uh, you know, talking with the ministry people, talking with, you know, uh, um, for example, the municipality bosses, you know, in East Africa, we were talking at some point, you know, we were exposed, I was exposed to the, you know, a, a conference of the uh, presidents where they were passing by looking about what was going on in terms of health, in terms of different things. So through these uh, five years, I was, you know, engaged in multiple uh, activities, you know, multiple research activities, but also some kind of implementation activities, which kind of, you know, uh, helped me to accumulate a lot of uh, uh, information, a lot of knowledge on how do you, you know, communicate, how do you kind of work together with different stakeholders, um, uh, and how do you do research in different context which you are not really familiar with because for example uh, uh east africa community was uh, more or less uh, an area which i was uh, used to but you know going to asia and indonesia that was you know different context so how do you adjust and readjust yourself in terms of uh, conducting this particular uh, uh, research now what have i learned um, um a key thing is you know doing research in dhs2 and specifically in the his um, network, this is, this is kind of an uh, action-oriented multiple disciplinary research, you know, we, we do a lot of, you know, iterative processes, which, you know, we come up with these ideas, we talk with the client, we engage with, with them, we try to see what works, what doesn't work, and, you know, we learn from that, and based on that learning in particular, we, you know, we engage uh, more and more, and I think that. Uh, showed me that, you know, um, while we are doing research, which is research is, you know, individual growth, but you're also making an impact within the area which you are doing. And that is something which I've seen in terms of what we have strengthened and then our health information systems in different areas which I've worked uh, uh, with in terms of collaborating with the Ministry of Health, you know, local stakeholders and actors. And I think another thing uh, which we kind of, you know, have a long term impact was, you know, the sustainability implementation, which we have been doing. For example, you know, um, you start with a pilot, but this pilot, you know, grow, they become a national policy, you know, and, and different stakeholders jump in and, and push that forward. And I think that that kind of uh, signature, that kind of impact is actually, you know, good. And also, um, I think as a researcher, you do your research, but you also see some kind of a long-term uh, uh, sustainable impact which you've done within a, a particular community. Then of course, the aspect of uh, engaging uh, local stakeholders to the global stakeholders, I think is quite important. I highlight about the East Africa's regional initiative which I've been doing. There's been other uh, regional initiative which I've been doing. And of course, the other thing which I see as a, a long-term impact is, you know, the growth, individual growth as a researcher and, you know, uh, individual growth also as a practitioner, which uh, uh, I've seen. Now, um, um, to look at the other side, um, and this is, I think it's my last slide, is, you know, I, I see there's a lot of um, synergy in terms of how this 
uh, doing research in um, you know DHS space, he said, um, help to generate knowledge that could be individual, could be a local, could be a community-wide knowledge. And I think uh, the important part is also how, uh, while you're generating that knowledge, you're also promoting the local practices which you see there. Um, it's not like you know you parachute in a place and, and you come up with your own kind of uh, you know uh, ideas, but you work together with the local team there where you kind of come up, you promote, you come up and promote these local practices. And of course, the, the network also helps in disseminating best practices from one location to another. And I think best out of all, I think, is the part of networking in a sense that, you know, you, um, you, you kind of uh, uh, strengthen your, your collaboration, you strengthen the people who you engage with. And I think through this particular networking, I think uh, this research which we're doing, uh, PhD, I mean, sorry, in, in, in DHS2 have uh, a long-term impact uh, locally and also uh, uh, globally. Um, I've tried to talk about, uh, you know, the experience in this particular way. Uh, my colleagues have also uh, talked about it in terms of, you know, different ways. But I think in the end, um, the PhD is a, it's, it's a tough journey. And, and I think you need to, 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 to always be tough as you go. Uh, one thing is uh, the, the environment within the University of Oslo Informatics Department. This uh, network is, is, is quite a good environment which promotes, encourage, you know, self, uh, I would say self, self growth um, and, and, and also kind of, um, you know, identify yourself within that particular community. Asante Sana. Thank you, Wilfred. Then we'll just move straight to the next uh, and last presenter, Seferino, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, uh, so that we are going to share here the, the, the uh, special thing, focusing on, uh, of course, we share all the, 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 the story that were shared by our colleagues. We are coming from the same school. Uh, we decided to focus our presentation on somehow the involvement in action research, looking at the experience and lessons that from um, the work that you have been doing uh, in the he in the years yeah, since 1999, and then for that I, I I decided to invite one of the veterans to start to, to start. So Emilio is going to start, and then I will take up the, the, the second part. No. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for this presentation. Uh, I'm trying to inspire here Zafarino just to explain to us uh, what kind of uh, energy is, uh, is bringing to, to the network. So uh, in Mozambique, uh, we've been involved with the um, uh, partnership with the University of Oslo since uh, 1999 uh, in research activity uh, on the area of uh, health information systems. So several capacity building activity has been uh, uh, performed. Uh, lots of work has been done. Uh, and also we have developed some of the exchange program uh, and also implemented uh, this exchange program uh, with cooperation, uh, with, collabor uh, with, with collaborating with the University of Oslo. Uh, but also through this uh, 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 collaboration, it was possible to develop uh, what we call here a critical mass of research on IS and uh, on health information system and um, created also developers, implemented and use users of uh, DHS2. Uh, the DHS2, as you know, is the national digital health platform in Mozambique. Uh, but uh, because of this uh, uh, knowledge that was created here, we managed also to network with uh, some of the countries in Africa that speak Portuguese, such as Angola, Cap Verde, Saint Tome, and Guinea Bissau. So the collaboration uh, among us with uh, 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 Angola and the Cap Verde also uh, was possible because 
of the collaboration between University of Oslo, South Digit and partners. Uh, here, when I mean partners, we refer it to WHO's, uh, UNDP, and other very important partner in these countries that provide a pool of resources and expertise to be used in the strength in the strength uh, the HIS. Uh, um, also, this this kind of support was possible to create and develop the capacity of the local uh, um, teams within the Ministry of Health of this country. Uh, in order to create this expertise on DHS2 and also in uh, strengthening uh, health information system. Uh, it's very important also to mention the collaboration uh, with these different part partners in, in these different countries that uh, make it, made it possible to, to develop some of the, 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 the uh, area where we are very much interested in like interoperability, uh, system scale up and um, the capacity building in, 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 in CAPVET. Uh, also the, the network expanded to Guinea-Bissau and San Tome where the establishment of cooperation platform, which include the University of Oslo, South Digit and the Minister of Health aim also to strengthen the country's health information system in this two countries. Uh, it's very important also here to mention that uh, um, the, the focus of this uh, collabor collaborative uh, uh, activity was to support teams with expertise on DHIS and health information system strengthening. Uh, as I said, there were different partners in these countries, for example, uh, in Cap Verde, uh, sorry, in, in Guinea-Bissau and San Tomé. Uh, was uh, uh, this different organization that you can see here, I mean, uh, like Redis, WHO, UNDP. Uh, uh, for example, in, 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 in Guinea-Bissau, there's also uh, a high commission that was established to, to, to deal with COVID-19. Uh, but also there are some uh, private company that are involved in, in, in all of these uh, activities that we are doing, such as uh, mobile operated uh, software company, all, all, all of them and uh, with uh, our support, uh, managed to, we managed to develop uh, some of the capacity of the human resource in these different countries uh, to develop some innovation and also to scale up some of the system. Uh, I think that this is a, it's a, it's a kind of a background that uh, Zephyrin will use to, 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 to explain some of the activity that we are doing in this specific area of research. Back to you, Zephyrin. Yeah. Thank you, Emilio. I will skip the two. The, uh, this is just overall uh, intervention areas. I think uh, we have already mentioned some of these. Uh, so going to the to, to, to how uh, I think uh, the, the comment now is how we, we we manage to involve practitioners in the in the in the in the, in the process in this research. So as I said, we used uh, usually the MOUs with the Ministry of Health with the global uh, and also the global problems as a as a backbone for the research activities. So through those, uh, we, we we also uh, uh, by engaging practitioners in. Uh, with partitioners, for example, in the day-to-day -day routines, uh, uh, for example, uh, the secondment of staff to the Minister of Health, uh, being members of technical working groups within the ministry, within the, the different programs, for example, uh, also uh, the, the willing and ability to address the problems, even when uh, the, the, is not some when the, most of those problems they are not uh, part of what the agreement that we, what we are supposed to 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 do what we are supposed to do in the in the in the, in the, in the ministries, for example, does help to, to to develop that trust so that uh, uh, to, today they, they they consider us, for example, as a part of the 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 the, the, the system. So we also, uh, the sharing of experience where we uh, managed to expose the global the HMIS uh, uh, problems, uh, so suggesting, for example, the, and the performing field study with the practitioners, this allows for them, them to be involved on the, on the research. So we, we did have the previous, in the previous presentation, we mentioned about when we did the, the work, field work here in Mozambique, we did have Minister of Health staff going with us in each of these facilities that we visit to look at the problems. And then and also we did manage based on that to enroll uh, some, to invite some of the, the staff, 
from the Minister of Health for this practitioner to take part of the master programs and the research activities. I think this is something that is, is a bit also for uh, happening by or being performed by the University of Oslo for age. That's why, for example, we uh, somehow did doing our PhD or we did our PhDs from the University of Oslo by being taken from our countries to participate in this process, to see the problem, to see how we can solve the problem, and then later on going back or coming back to, to our countries or to our contest, trying to uh, materialize those everything that we learned or during the, 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 the study that we have been performing uh, in our PhD. So also motivating these, uh, the, the practitioners to share the experience in the public events, like for example, in this digital academy where we did, for example, uh, for, for us, we did have a track uh, on, on, on Tuesday where we did uh, uh, invited Minister of Health to present uh, to share the experience on how they are dealing with this problem and then to, to start uh, conversation about the way how to address most of the, of the, the, the issue that they are facing. Uh, the other thing is also the involvement of students in the, in the research. Uh, we know that okay, the common interest areas uh, are served also the basis for developing MOU with the, and the collaborative programs with universities, we talk lo local universities. This is allows for example staff and students internship. For example, ourselves, myself and Emilio, we are here at South Digital, but at the same time, we are we, we, so, uh, giving lectures at university, at, at university. So there is a, this uh, MOU agreement that between South Digital and University of uh, Edward Mondland that allows us to come to, 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 to do some activity in South Digital and then get the, this experience, for example, expose them to the, to the, to the, to the master students or undergraduate students so that they, they, they can see what are the problems and then together we can uh, perform better or to try to find out how to address those problems. Um, just for example, we, by taking the students, going to perform field work with them, uh, exposing those issues, for example, that okay, how to try together to see how this can be uh, solved. Uh, setting up uh, the, the, the last point here is about uh, the, the, the innovation hub or the hub that we, 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 we set up here with the, with the aim of uh, uh, bringing students to, to, to the, the internship here, which is going to somehow uh, uh, create uh, this uh, need or uh, appetite for them to start doing the research because they will be looking at ourselves here doing this presentation, sharing the experience. Maybe they will say, okay, this I would like to do to do this and do that. We do have experience here locally that some of our colleagues that, that, that came here as undergraduate student, they're doing their master, the other they will be maybe doing their, their, their PhDs. So that, that somehow we are exposing those problems and they're doing the ex exchange of students with partner universities. So, uh, with, uh, so far, this has been um, uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, engaging, whether there is engine there, but it's, uh, it's engaging, evolving ethic. So we, um, we have learned a lot, I think, uh, everyone. Uh, so I will take this to, to explain, but we have learned a lot, and then we are still learning, and, and it, there is a lot of to be shared. Uh, uh, but as I said, we are ex inspiring other uh, colleagues, uh, wherever we are, we go in the countries to for them to start looking uh, the, 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 the problem, see how they can do research, how, and also how they can engage on this on the, the, the same path that we, we, have, we have gone through. Uh, I know that uh, we are, uh, how, thank you very much. Uh, I, will, I will send it back to Johan. Johan is uh, no longer here, I'm afraid. Uh, so you have to stick with me, Severino. Okay, okay. So, uh, Good. <laughs> yeah, fine. So thank you very much uh, to Emilio and uh, Severino uh, about that uh, uh, interesting uh, networking of Lucifon countries in, in Africa. That's, uh, that's uh, interesting. And how is it? Uh, of course, now we have heard uh, uh, from the kind of the top of the cake, I mean, the high hanging fruits, the, the PhDs, but there are also other ways uh, to engage in research than uh, only through PhD. That's one thing uh, we should not forget. But in any case, any any of uh, in the audience that have some questions and uh, comments and some interest in this area, please, please uh, come on. <laughs> 